Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm Carter Sneed, the director of the Center for Ethics and Culture here at the University of Notre Dame. It's great to see so many familiar faces here today, and I'm especially delighted to welcome those of you who might be attending your first Center for Ethics and Culture event. Today's lecture is part of the Center's Catholic Culture Series, which focuses on prominent Catholic figures in literature and the arts in order to expose members of the Notre Dame community and beyond to the richness of our Catholic cultural heritage. Since 2002, this lecture series has featured speakers such as Thomas Hibbs, John Finnis, Ian Kerr, Peter Lawler, Megan Cox Gurdon, Ron Hansen, and Ralph McInerney, just to name a few. Before I introduce this evening's guest, I just want to remind everyone that immediately following the lecture, we'll have a book sale and a signing outside the auditorium, as well as a reception in the Scholars Lounge across the hall. I hope you'll be able to join us. Today, we are honored and delighted to welcome my friend, uh, George Weigel, who will offer reflections on his newest book, Lessons in Hope, My Unexpected Life with St. John Paul II. George is a distinguished senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, DC, where he holds the William E. Simon Chair in Catholic <coughs> Studies. He is also a permanent research fellow here at the Center for Ethics and Culture. He's the author or editor of more than 20 books, including the two-part biography of Pope St. John Paul II, Witness to Hope, and The End and the Beginning. <coughs> His essays, op-eds, columns, and reviews appear regularly in major opinion journals and newspapers across the United States, including the Washington Post, USA Today, and the National Review. You may also recognize George from his role as Senior Vatican Analyst for NBC News, in which he has com uh, commented on major Catholic events, including the death of St. John Paul II and the elections of both Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis. We are honored and delighted to have him back with us again here at the University of Notre Dame. Please join me in welcoming George Weigel. Thank you, uh, Carter, and good afternoon. Everyone, it's a great pleasure to be back here. Uh, I, I sense a happy atmosphere after yesterday's bowl game ratings came out. Uh, I commiserate with those of you who are Dodgers fans. Uh, but it's, it's wonderful to be here and to be part of an event sponsored by this very, very important center, which is important not simply for this university, but for the life of the church in the United States uh, and throughout uh, the world. I think this will be more uh, interesting for all of us if it takes the form of a conversation. So I'm going to give uh, you maybe a half an hour of opening uh, remarks, and then I would like to open this up to your questions, because the book uh, I'm presenting to you today is really an anecdotal book, and that lends itself to some, some real conversation, I hope. On the night of December 15th, 2004, uh, I was having dinner with uh, a rapidly declining John Paul II in his dining room in the papal apartment in the Apostolic Palace in Rome, and at the end of that uh, meal, I went around and, uh, to say goodnight and thank him. And uh, as he was a bit uh, wobbly at that point, uh, I went down on one knee and kissed his ring, which I think was the first time I had ever done that in the almost 20 years we'd known each other. And I said to him, uh, uh, Holy Father, if you don't bury me, uh, I promise you I will finish what I began. <clears throat> Namely, I would finish telling his story. Witness to Hope, which had been published in 1999 uh, and had been translated into probably nine or 10 languages by 2004, still only took the story up to uh, 1998, the end of 1998. So there, there was more to tell and I promised him I would do. That turned out <clears throat> to be the Last Supper, uh, as far as we were concerned. 
Uh, six weeks later, he was in the hospital for the first time and the, the drama of the end of his life, which I called uh, later the last encyclical, because I think it was his last great teaching moment as he led the entire church into an experience of the Paschal mystery through, through his own uh, suffering and death. Um, uh, I spent the next five years uh, thinking about uh, and preparing uh, to keep that promise I had made on the night of December 15th, 2004. Uh, the result of that was <clears throat> the second volume, The End and the Beginning, which was published in, uh, in 2010. And I thought at that point that that, that was it. Uh, I had spent between 1995 and 2010 producing two very large books with tons of apparatus and endnotes and footnotes and bibliography and all that good stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, it seemed to me I had fulfilled the promise I had made. Then I started going around the country and the world presenting that book, and um, I discovered something interesting. The end and the beginning is a slightly oddly structured book in that it doesn't pick up where Witness to Hope left off. Uh, there is a different kind of first one-third of the book, which retells the story of John Paul II and Carol Wojtyla's uh, fight against communism and the communist war against the Catholic Church. Uh, <clears throat> and I did that because uh, shortly after he died, uh, I was given a cache of materials from uh, communist secret police files. Uh, the Polish SB, the East German Stasi, the Soviet KGB, the Hungarian secret police, uh, which had, had only become available then as the archives of these evil uh, forces were being opened to scholarly investigation, and some friends of mine had made copies of various things. They thought I might be interested in it. This was such fascinating stuff that I thought, okay, I'm going to take the first third of the second volume and revisit the whole question of the war against the church, and Wojtyla's role in uh, bringing that to a satisfactory and victorious conclusion uh, on the side of, of the right uh, people. And yet when I went around talking about the book, I found that people were not interested in that stuff at all. I mean, that's the stuff I thought was interesting in the book. Here, I mean, here's all this really cool spook stuff, you know, uh, straight out of Ian Fleming or Dan Silva or whoever, and people did not want to talk about that. What, it, what they wanted were stories. Uh, he had been dead by, for five years at that point. Uh, I think there was a sense in some people's minds that he was beginning to, to drift away, uh, become less tangible. And people wanted stories that would, that would bring him uh, back uh, closer in. And the more I thought about that, uh, the more it occurred to me that that impulse, that instinct for wanting stories, was the same uh, spiritual instinct that uh, had produced those extraordinary popular uh, hagiographies and lives of the saints in the Middle Ages that were collected in, in one very famous multi-volume work by uh, Jacob Dvorajin called The Golden Legend. Some of you may be familiar with that. And I thought, uh, perhaps I hadn't fulfilled my promise to him on that last night because I hadn't told all of the stories. Uh, and perhaps telling those stories would help people recapture a sense of him. Uh, particularly after the beatification and canonization. You know, we, we beatify or canonize somebody, they tend to get put up on a shelf, and that's, that's it. I mean, they get iconized. Um, so, uh, I decided I would tell the stories, and that's what produced uh, this uh, third panel uh, in the triptych. Um, a, a very different kind of book. There's not an end note in it. Uh, I think there are only two footnotes. Uh, one of them has to do with classmates of Father Kimes here and a 
student kitchen they ran in uh, the North American College in Rome. Um, but it's all stories, and I hope they are stories which illuminate facets of Carol Wojtyla's remarkable life uh, as a priest, as bishop, and as pope in ways that really would not have been appropriate in, in these two vol volumes of scholarly biography. And the, the two light motifs that, that, that structure most of Lessons in Hope are drawn from something he said to me in March 1996 and something he had said 14 years before uh, in Fatima. In March 1996, I was leaving the papal apartment after a dinner conversation during which we had talked about uh, the ground rules, how, how, I would, how I would proceed for the next three years to produce what became Witness to Hope. And on the way out, the Pope said to me in a, in a wistful frame of mind, not angrily or aggressively, but almost wistfully speaking of other biographical efforts, they try to understand me from the outside, but I can only be understood from inside. I can only be understood from inside. Um, that seemed to me about right. Um, as I relate in Lessons to Hope, the experience that had put it in my mind that I might attempt a biography of John Paul II was the experience of reading and then reviewing Tad Schultz's biography of the Pope, the truly dreadful piece of work. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, when I'm reading a book for review, I, I put X's in the margin when there's a mistake. Well, by the time I got through with Schultz's book, it looked like I had been playing tic-tac-toe with myself, and I was X. I mean, it was just, uh, I, I, believe, I think it was Peggy Steinfels of Laetare Medal fame who said of that uh, book, this is like a biography of Michael Jackson written by someone who neither knows nor cares about basketball. Uh, you know, you're gonna get a few interesting bits, but you know, you're not gonna really get, get the, the gravamen of the person. Um, so pondering that question of getting to John Paul II from the inside uh, meant understanding him in different terms than others had uh, tried to apply. Uh, it meant, in the first instance, understanding him as a radically converted Christian disciple. Uh, in the second instance, it meant understanding him as a committed priest of the church who saw the priesthood as a vocation uh, to lift up the dignity of the human person in the face of the uh, 20th century, mid 20th century totalitarianisms. It meant understanding him as a bishop for whom bishoping was a heroic virtue. Uh, was, uh, the bishop was the defensor civitatis. He was the last line of defense of, of the city and, and its people. And then understanding him as a pope from the inside meant understanding him according to the, the antiphon that was chosen for the psalm response uh, at his 40th um, uh, uh, no, sorry, 50th uh, anniversary uh, mass in 1996, Luke 22, 32, and you, Peter, when you have been converted, you must turn and strengthen your brethren. That was his idea of the papacy. The second thing he said uh, 14 years before that that had a profound influence on how I went about my work uh, happened on May 13th, 1982. It was uh, to the day, one year, since he had been uh, shot in his front yard, St. Peter's Square, and um, he had come on pilgrimage to the Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima uh, to give thanks for his life being spared that day. And when he got off the plane outside of Lisbon to be driven to Fatima, he said in an almost throwaway line uh, in the midst of his uh, formal uh, remarks, in the designs of providence, there are no mere coincidences. 
Now, the world may have thought it was completely coincidental, random, that uh, he had been shot on the liturgical memorial of Our Lady of Fatima, May 13th. He did not think of it in those terms. As he said, on many occasions, one hand fired and another guided the bullet. And uh, when one considers that a professional assassin was standing as close to him as I am to Father Kimes, firing at point blank uh, range and misses his abdominal aorta by one millimeter, uh, which if hit would have meant he was dead before they got in, uh, into the basilica, much less to a hospital, one begins to understand what he means. So those two remarks, I can only be understood from the inside, and in the designs of providence there, no, um, uh, there are no coincidences. A, a coincidence is simply some facet of divine providence that we don't quite understand yet, we don't know how to put into the picture frame yet. Uh, led me to look at his life in a distinctive way, uh, which I think is unpacked in, in Witness to Hope in the end and the beginning, uh, but it also led me to look at my own life uh, in a different uh, way, and I'll get, I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but let me say a few more words about what it meant to try to understand him from the inside. It certainly meant trying to understand him as, a, as an intellectual as a very intriguing hybrid philosopher, the fundaments, the bases of whose philosophical system were the metaphysical and epistemological realism of Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, but the superstructure of which was this very contemporary phenomenological method of, uh, of analysis. Uh, it made him a modern mind with a distinctively modern critique of modernity. Did not make him a pre-modern mind. This was the mistake that the German-speaking world made about him for, uh, well, we're on to 40 years and they're still making the mistake uh, today. Uh, but even more importantly, it made him uh, this, this living from inside out uh, meant grappling with him as a man of uh, intense prayer. Uh, one example of this, which I, actually I did not put in the book, but I, which I think is relevant to the discussion here, uh, happened in the early years of the pontificate. John Paul II, like most Polish intellectuals of his generation, was a Francophile. Uh, he was deeply uh, immersed in French literature, French uh, thought, um, uh, and he was deeply concerned about the state of the church in, in France. You may remember that when he went there in an early pilgrimage, I believe in 1980 or 81, the first thing he said was, France, eldest daughter of the church, have you forgotten the promises of your baptism? little in your face there. Um, now, how to turn that around. He had become very impressed at a distance with a remarkable character whose original name was Aaron, as in the brother of Moses. Uh, and Aaron Lustige was the son of Polish Jewish emigres who had come to live in France in the 1920s. He had been born in France during the Second World War. His mother was uh, killed at Auschwitz. His father died shortly thereafter. And during the war, while he was hiding with a Catholic family, he converted to Catholicism and took the Christian name Jean-Marie. And that is how those of you who know him know him as, as Jean-Marie Lustige, although if you go to his tomb, in Notre Dame, in Paris today, the slab says Aaron Jean-Marie Lustiger. Okay, here's this really quite striking character. Consider this. In a lecture hall at the Sorbonne in the early 1950s, there were two young men sitting in the same lectures, perhaps even on the same bench, uh, who were both not native Frenchman 
in, in the normal sense of the term. One of them was Lustiger, and the other was a Cambodian intellectual named Paul Pott. Now, if you wanted to write the great novel of the 20th century, you begin with that scene, and then you can just unfold. I mean, it's told with tall story, where are you when we need you here, right? Um, Lustiger, uh, after finishing his undergraduate studies, enters the seminary and then becomes the chaplain of the Sorbonne where he meets a remarkable group of young people, some of whom uh, come to the center occasionally, Rémy Brog, Jean-Luc Marion, etc. And he has been made the Bishop of Orléans in, uh, in France. Uh, and uh, the Archbishop of Paris, Francois Marty, um, uh, is past the retirement date. And so they have to pick, Pope has to pick a new Archbishop of Paris. And the usual list comes in from the usual suspects and he doesn't like any of this. And he decides that he is going to take this Polish, Jewish, French bishop from Orléans and put him in Paris. Because he thinks he's got the intellectual chops and the spiritual depth to deal with this desperately uh, difficult uh, situation. So uh, Lustiger gets the phone call from the nuncio and says he can't do that. He says this is impossible. It is impossible for a man with my background to be the Archbishop of Paris. So he declines the appointment. Um, and uh, then he gets a phone call, or perhaps it was a visit, I'd have to look that up, from then Monsignor Stanislav Jeevish, John Paul II's longtime secretary, who says to him, uh, Your Excellency, you are the fruit of the prayer of the Holy Father. You are the fruit of the prayer of the Holy Father. He did not come to this idea you know, over lunch someday. Let's, you know, let's shake things up by putting Lustiger in Paris. He had, he had prayed this out of himself. And at that point, of course, Lustiger, what are you going to say? So he concedes and goes on to have a remarkable 20-some years as, as the Archbishop of Paris. So to understand him from inside out uh, was to understand him as a, a man of, of intense prayer for whom the best hour of the day was the first hour of the day, uh, the hour of private prayer before his morning mass. Um, and as then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger said to me of that hour, everything else proceeds from that. It's the dialogue with the Lord that is fundamental for his pastoral work, for his intellectual work, uh, for everything, his public activity. A second example of praying something into existence uh, would be World Youth Day. Uh, we now think of this as a regular part of the global rhythm of Catholic life. Every three years, a million kids get together with the Pope. You know, that's just what happens every three years, right? In 1983, when he was pondering the question of what the church could do to reach out to the young and, and came up with this idea, he was told by virtually everyone, you are crazy. There is no way this can happen. There is no way this can happen. But because he had prayed over that inspiration and because he had processed in prayer uh, the remarkable series of friendships with young people that he had formed in the 1940s, late 1940s and early 1950s when he was a university chaplain. Um, he thought it was in fact not just doable, but mandatory. And so now we have, beginning in 1984 in Rome and, and, and around the world ever since, uh, these extraordinary things, which no one thought possible on October 16th, 1978, the day he was elected. I mean, if you had said on that day, well, one of the things that's going to happen over the next little while is that there will be a biennial or triennial meeting of a million young people from around the world with the Pope, 
you know, they would have hauled you off the platform and uh, put you someplace where you could uh, relax a little bit. Um, and yet there it was, another reality that was, that was prayed into existence. Another facet of understanding him from inside involved uh, what one of his kids from those days, who went on to become the vice rector of the Krakow Academy of Music, um, Teresa Maletska told, uh, characterized for me as his permanent openness. Permanent openness. Um, there's an awful lot of talk about dialogue in the church today, and rather not too much of it. This was a different reality with Wojtyla, particularly in his pastoral life, when it was all open conversation all the time. Uh, and that continued in his work as a bishop, where he began, without intending to do so, but nonetheless achieving the stitching together of previously divided groups of resistance to communism people, the workers, intellectuals, teachers, professionals, whatever, bringing them together uh, and getting them to talk to each other through the medium of his permanent openness, and that helped lay some of the foundations of the Solidarity Movement. But it extended as well into his um, life as Pope. And, and here we come to one of my favorite uh, sets of anecdotes in Lessons in Hope, which involves uh, John Paul II's personal 007. Uh, who was um, quite different from uh, Ian Fleming's 007. Uh, in the first place, it was a she, not a he. Uh, it was a woman named Irina uh, Alberti, uh, Russian by birth, married an Italian diplomat, um, raised her family, was widowed rather early, uh, comes from Paris, where she was living, to Rome with a friend. Uh, the friend has connections. They're in the first row of the uh, papal audience. Pope is working the, the rope line, so to speak, after that. And she starts speaking to him in Russian. And he responds in, in that language. And they talk for a bit. And as he's moving along, he says over his shoulder, uh, come to lunch the next time you're in Rome. This struck her as an interesting uh, instruction, but what do you do about it? So she went to her confessor in, uh, in Paris and said, the Pope just told me to call him for lunch, what do I do? She said, you call Monsignor Javish and tell him the Pope invited you to lunch, that's what you do. So she did, and there began an intense conversation over the next uh, 15 or 20 years. And as the situation in what was then the Soviet Union began to change, she would go back on a regular basis and then continued this after the dramatic changes of 1991 as kind of his personal agent to be in touch with uh, Russian intellectuals, Russian church people, uh, Russian artists and scholars, and then let him know what she thought, because he had this intuition about her, undoubtedly prayed over, that, that she would sense things and perceive things that, that his diplomats on the scene, you know, would just not get. It would just go, go over their heads. It took someone who actually knew the culture from the inside. This, of course, drove the diplomats completely crazy, uh, but he had the confidence in her to continue uh, this relationship uh, for, for uh, the better part of, of two decades uh, in the hope that it might bear some fruit uh, in a real opening between Rome and, and the Russian uh, Orthodox uh, Church. I don't know too many other popes in history who would have done something like that, but it was another facet of this permanent openness. He was open to inputs 
from people who were not professional <clears throat> church people and who might have disagreed with him about things, uh, as in fact Mrs. Alberti did on a number uh, of points. Um, but that permanent openness kept a kind of permanent freshness to the pontificate uh, that I think was evident right up until uh, the end. The other uh, facet of learning him from the inside that I try to bring out a little more clearly in, in this book is what I would call a genuine pastor's heart. Uh, he never forgot that he was a priest, he never forgot that he, he was a pastor, and, and the most dramatic um, uh, evidence of that, in, in my case, uh, was at that last dinner on December 15th, 2004. Uh, my father had died on October 19th of that year. Uh, the Pope had sent a telegram uh, to be read at the uh, funeral. Vatican, I think, is the last place in the world that still sends telegrams, um, which was very nice, but it had been almost two months. He was in very difficult physical circumstances himself, and yet when I walked into the dining room that night, uh, the first thing he said to me was not, hello, good evening, uh, buon Natale, or whatever. Uh, he said, how's your mother doing? First thing he said to me, how, how's your mother doing? I mean, great, great pastor's heart and uh, memory. There's one other episode from that evening that's uh, uh, perhaps uh, amusing to relate. Um, I had discovered, <coughs> excuse me, um, in 1997, when I had been given a walkthrough of the Pope's really private quarters, bedroom, study, all that stuff. And I noticed in the bedroom that there was a coffee table with a lot of picture books on it. You know, we, coffee table books of photographs, particularly of natural scenes, mountains, rivers, oceans, whatever. And I said to Monsignor Javish, what's that all about? And he said, well, he likes to look at those at night. You know, get the old poet's imagination uh, fired up here. So, uh, I had brought him for a Christmas present in 2004, this huge book of national parks of the United States. That it, it just literally filled my suitcase. It was a very big thing. And I schlep, it's wrapped, and I schlep it up to the uh, <coughs> papal apartment. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, John Paul II uh, was a guy who believed in um, uh, opening his Christmas presents when he got them. So <laughs> he laboriously opens this thing, and then whoop, we go over to the table of contents, and he gets down to Rocky Mountain National Park. Over we go to Rocky Mountain National Park, he looks at the pictures of that, he said, mm, Rocky Mountain National Park, Denver, World Youth Day, 1993. Bishops of America said it couldn't be done. I proved them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, still bringing the heat at, uh, at, 80, at age 82. He could still throw the inside fastball. Um, this uh, inside business, of course, um, coheres with the no coincidences business. And while that was very much true of his own life and his understanding of his own life, it uh, led me to think of my life in a different way. Uh, I told some of uh, Professor Sneed's Soren fellows at lunch today that I, I am a career planner's nightmare in that I have never ended up doing at the end of one decade what I thought I would be doing at the beginning. I, mean, I just don't have a career. I hope I have a vocation. Um, and following instincts like, you know, you ought to write the biography of John Paul II um, has been part of that vocational uh, living. But, but doing that with him led me to see what might have seemed utterly random things in my previous life as, as remote preparations for this 15 years of work on, on two books. 
And the um, uh, Lessons in Dope actually begins with the first of these, uh, which takes us to uh, Baltimore, where I grew up, in the old cathedral school, and it's about to be Lent 1960. Now, I understand for some of you that sounds like the uh, Jurassic period, 1960 here. It wasn't that long ago, but in any event, I'm in the third grade. And uh, Sister Mary Euphemia gets on the uh, loudspeaker, as she did every morning, to lead the prayers and the Pledge of Allegiance and all the stuff we did every day at the beginning of the school day, and announces that each of the eight grades of the school is going to spend all of Lent praying for the conversion of a communist dictator. You're nine years old in Baltimore in 1960. You only heard of one communist dictator. I mean, it was Nikita Khrushchev, who had made himself uh, rather visible by banging his shoe on a table at the uh, UN uh, that year. So we really hope we're going to get the big cheese here. We're going we're to get Khrushchev for our designated prayee. So after we get back from, from the Basilica, from the Old Cathedral uh, and Ash Wednesday Mass and Ashes, Sister Florence writes our guy's name on the board. And I think a lot of us thought in our third grade way, whatever this is, it's a language that needs a few less consonants and a few more vowels. Because what she had written was Władysław Gomułka, the, the communist dictator, of, uh, the head of the Polish United Workers' Party, the Polish Communist Party. Now, uh, we probably pronounced his name incorrectly for the next seven weeks. The efficacy of our prayers for his conversion is not attested to by history. Um, Perhaps, I mean, who knows, but uh, there's no overt evidence that these prayers were particularly efficacious. Uh, but you can't tell me that that did not plant some sort of a seed in my head that would flower years later when I would be writing about Gomulka's very complicated role in the history of church-state relations in Poland and whatnot. Same has to do with my undergraduate study of philosophy. I certainly had no idea when I was reading Edmund Husserl in my junior and senior year of college, that I would be uh, unpacking the thought of a Husserlian Polish pope 35 years later. Uh, I had no idea when I was uh, working in the Congress to pry uh, Lithuanian uh, priests and nuns out of gulag camps in the mid-1980s, that that would redound into a whole series of experiences that that led me uh, to John Paul II, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I came to understand myself uh, in a different way uh, through the prism of his insistence that in the designs of providence there are no mere coincidences. And so the first third of this book is a series of, of vignettes of, of these seemingly completely random things that happened to me over a period of of 40 years that nonetheless were one form or another of preparation for uh, taking on the task of being John Paul II's uh, biographer. And I hope there's a lesson in that for, for other people. Um, I'm not suggesting myself as, as a model. Uh, as I say, I'm a career planner's nightmare. I don't wish that kind of uh, helter-skelter uh, life on too many people. There is a, a point in uh, planning. Uh, but what, as I said to the students this afternoon, uh, if there is a lesson in that, it is to always be attentive to whatever promptings uh, the Holy Spirit or your guardian angel or who your patron saint or whoever uh, puts into your head about uh, answering the question, what ought I be doing? in a surprising way. Be open to the surprises, as, as indeed he was, and as I have found uh, in my own life, is a, is a fruitful and um, uh, spiritually enriching uh, way to live. Um, last note, and then we can, we can talk about all this a bit. Um, 
uh, when the Pope was canonized. I got a call from the then op-ed editor at the Wall Street Journal <clears throat> saying we want you to write the, the big op-ed piece for the day before the canonization. And I said, um, you know, what, what, <laughs> what, what more can I possibly say? I really don't think I've got anything new to say. And he said, uh, sleep on it and get back to me. And I did, and I thought about it. And then I wrote a piece that appeared uh, that weekend in the journal in which uh, I said that if there is a lesson from this life uh, for those who are not part of the, the household of faith, but who are men and women of goodwill, uh, disturbed by the state of affairs uh, in the world, um, it is to never submit <clears throat> to the tyranny of the possible the notion that some things simply are and it's impossible to do anything about them. If you look at the broad swath of his life, as I, as I tried to do in those 850 words in the journal, I said, look at three things in 1978. Uh, in 1978, the Berlin Wall and the permanent geopolitical division of Europe um, seemed as fixed a reality of the world as there was. I mean, this just wasn't going to change. And people's accession or acquiescence to that notion that things couldn't change is what I call the tyranny of, of the possible. And yet, 10 years later, 11 years later, the wall was down. 10 years later, it was, it was crumbling. Uh, in 1978, when John Paul II was elected, uh, no one thought uh, young people were interested in the Catholic Church. As we've already reviewed in, in thinking about the emergence of World Youth Day, th that tyranny was decisively overthrown uh, by uh, this man and his conviction that uh, the music might be different, but the human yearnings and longings for an integrated life and living with a whole heart uh, remained the same that he had encountered uh, 40 years before. And, and the results are, are quite colossal. Uh, and the third thing I mentioned was uh, no one in 1978 uh, thought the Catholic Church had anything to say to the sexual revolution except we surrender, uh, a view not without prominence on, on certain Catholic campuses at that time. Uh, he thought that was another surrender to the tyranny of the possible. He writes the theology of the body. Marriage preparation work throughout the living parts of the Catholic Church is fundamentally transformed. And the uh, Jewish editor of the Weekly Standard, Bill Kristol, in writing uh, his uh, review of Witness to Hope said this is not simply a contribution to Catholic thought, this theology of the Bible, this is a contribution to human thought. This is a contribution to human civilization. Nobody expected that in 1978. But he refused to submit to the tyranny of, well, that's all that's possible. You know, live with it, get along with it, etc. cetera. Uh, we're at a moment of some air turbulence uh, in the country. Uh, in the world, uh, in the church. I think it's good to keep that in mind. Uh, don't submit to the tyranny of it has to be this way. And let's also remember that whatever air turbulence, particularly in the church that we experience today, this is not 1978. There was a 35 year period of solidity which has put us in a much stronger position to work through uh, the challenges of the present moment, including what I think one has to say is the utter collapse of the Catholic reality in the German-speaking uh, parts of the world and in the Low Countries and in large parts of France, uh, but also the challenges we experience here in the United States, in Canada, uh, from uh, the pressures of the dictatorship of relativism, we're in a much better position to address that today than we were uh, almost 50 years ago, uh, 40 years ago. We're, we're in a much stronger position and 
places like the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture are the living uh, embodiment of that. This didn't exist uh, back then either. Uh, this was a fruit of, of that renaissance and we should not forget that as we address uh, some of the challenges we experience today. Thank you. And now before we rush out so that all of you can do your Christmas shopping early, uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. Carter, are you going to recognize Just people? One thing I want to mention real quick is after the remarks, we're going to have a book signing outside and a reception in the scholars lounge just across the way. So those of you who want to continue the conversation after this question period, please, uh, you, you can join us there as well. So um, I'm going to ask the first question though. Yeah, sure. The director of the Center for <coughs> Culture. Um, uh, the, uh, what were your principles of inclusion and exclusion in terms of thinking about the stories that you wanted to, to, to have in this book when you're thinking about your goal of sort of bringing to mind St. John Paul II to those who, for whom he might be drifting away? Yeah. Um, the first principle of exclusion uh, was summed up by my dear friend, editor and publisher, Laura Heimert, saying to me of the manuscript, you have to cut it by one third. <laughs> I had had such a good time doing this that the cup had literally run us over. And uh, <clears throat> I had sent her a manuscript of almost 600 pages. Um, so she told me, you got to get this down to 400 because that's the only thing that's going to work uh, in book terms. So I took, a lot, I took a lot of the front end stuff uh, there's less me in this than there was in, in, the, in, the, in the first iteration. Um, but I, I think it was, it was trying to respond at all points to misapprehensions. This is a guy who didn't understand. This is a guy who lived in his own little orbit. This is a pre-modern mind. You know, go through the whole list. So what are the things? And then some of them are just really good stories. Um, we will mark next week the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik expropriation of the Russian People's Revolution and uh, <clears throat> by Lenin and company. Well, there's just a wonderful story that I could not not put in this book about one night we are talking about the Pope's play, Wojtyla's play, Bratnashego Boja, Our God's Brother, about St. Albert Milovsky, who's this kind of avant-garde artist turned radical Franciscan uh, Pavarello who's working with the poor in, uh, in Krakow in the late 19th, uh, early 20th century. And there's a character in this play called The Stranger. It just doesn't have a name, just called The Stranger. And the stranger um, is a political revolutionary. And he too claims to be on the side of the poor. And so the brother Albert figure and the stranger go at it uh, argumentatively throughout the play. Uh, it's in a sense Voitewa working out his own thoughts on revolutionary violence, nonviolence, et cetera. Well, people had thought for a while, maybe this is Lenin. Because there was a story, I mean, Lenin was certainly in Krakow during that period. Um, and there was some indication that he had lived for a while in Zakopane, the big town in the Tatra Mountains. So I said to the Pope over dinner, um, we were talking about this play, I said, is the stranger Lenin? Just came out and said it. And he said, is crypto Lenin? And then we said, well, which meant it's Lenin. Uh, <laughs> And then we started talking about this possibility that, that Lenin and Albert Milovsky, later to be canonized by JP2, had met in Zakopane. And he said he thought it was true and he had seen the house where Lenin had lived there and where this meeting had taken place. And then, then the Pope said, you know, the Austrians arrested him there, meaning Lenin. The Austro-Hungarian, and I said, well, it would have been a lot easier for everybody if they just held on to him. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, the Pope and Jeevish and Bishop Rilko all kind of, 
you know, at the same time because they clearly shared that view. That was too good to leave, uh, leave out. So the chuckle value was a principle of, of inclusion here uh, as uh, well. Yes, Father Kress. I was going to <coughs> your suggestion that you only wrote three books on Pope John Paul II, which is the Pope, the, 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 the credo, the, the lesson of Pope, and the end of the beginning. But I say the first book was the final revolution, right. how 70 years of Stalinist tyranny would collapse. And what I like, what I wanted to ask you about, when General, I, I, I recall the major focus in that first book, 70 years of Stalinist would collapse, was in, in chapter two, the virtue of prudence, calling good and evil by name. In chapter three, the virtue of justice, Catholics and the commissars, human rights. Chapter four, on courage, the virtue of courage. And then how, you know, how that kind of, the, 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 the chapter seven, the, 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 the virtues, yeah. no monopoly, faith, hope, charity, the key carnal virtues, no monopoly, they belong as much to, you know, the sure. Catholic, well, the, I call it the Catholic version of the common moral tradition. But I love how you follow up on that, in these latter books, uh, when I can need help as a as a, as a struggling to be honest Christian Catholic, and of course the, all the confusion of the culture, I really do go back to John Paul and those who worked with him, Benedict and others. And you know, I think a quick way as well, Jay, that they could survive the Stalinist terror and the U.S. Yeah. could survive the word. And then, ironically, what I focus on, and your, and the, the, I call it then your second, third verse, uh, the books on John Paul were the witness to hope. Rooted in faith, mm. which nurtures it with a greater charity. Mm -hmm. And I love the way you put it too in a number of places. It, it normally happens at the interior of family life, in family life, the basic social units where you have know, fathers and mothers and babies and kids and grandmas and grandkids and so forth, and all over the world, wherever. So that focus, I, I think too, I was going to ask if, if you know, if I can only stand John Paul from the inside, not the outside, understand. And, and, and you know how uh, the key cardinal virtues and then the theological virtues, mm -hmm. faith, hope, and charity, yeah. would nurture and ever, you know, uh, uh, or just would shape us and get us ready for heaven. Well, I, uh, I, that's exactly right intuition <laughs> because uh, somewhat to my intense surprise, uh, I was invited in 2000, five, no, 2006, to be an official witness for the beatification canonization process, which among other things meant completing this enormous questionnaire. And to my surprise and an actual instruction, the second half of the questionnaire asked you to think about this life through the prism of the theological virtues and the cardinal virtues. So there were, you know, four or five questions on faith, four or five questions on hope, four or five questions on charity, four or five questions on prudence, justice, moderation, and courage. And I found that such an intriguing way to kind of reframe the whole life that I adopted that as the framework for the last part of the end and the beginning when I do a much longer evaluation of the man and his accomplishment than I could do when he was still alive uh, and Witness to Hope came out. So you, you discerned exactly <laughs> the right uh, framework uh, there. Um, you know what I love too there? <coughs> the way you just summarized it for us today, and how do we not only survive and thrive in other ways, but going back to what, what he put on paper, I think you mentioned uh, the splendor of truth Hmm. The gospel of life, the letter to families, and I love you know what I love and you, what you have in your book when, when he what I <coughs> as much as anything he put on paper was in the latter stages of his life how he was suffering and dying and you took, took that uh, in, you know the end of the beginning and and you know the the uh, his, his letter his, he wrote the letter to the letter the Christian meaning of human suffering after after the assassination yeah, yeah, yeah. but then that came back to the end of his life. Right. Giving us more than an example of, uh, and then of course, the, like the way you just cited a few moments ago, theology of love, sexual mm -hmm. differentiation, mm -hmm. complementarity, and 
how important that is for all of us to survive the contemporary disorder in culture. Yeah. I mean, back I, to the basics. Yeah. Tell you one uh, more story from that uh, uh, witness uh, <coughs> process. Um, after this, this long, complicated series of questions on uh, thinking through this life through the virtues, there was, there was uh, a section at the end, sort of other questions. And, and one of the questions was, have you ever seen a depiction of the servant of God? You know, the title we give to people who are en route to be out of the kitchen. Have you ever seen a picture of the servant of God with a halo? So I called up the postulator, the priest who was in charge of this, who had become a friend uh, at that point. He was a Polish canon lawyer in Rome. And I said, Swavak, what on earth is question number 124? What was this halo business? And he just laughed and said, well, that's actually a, a, a kind of leftover from the old medieval inquiry into that the guy called the devil's advocate would, would, would do. Because it was thought back in the Middle Ages that the premature depiction of someone with a halo before they had been officially beatified or canonized might be a sign of satanic influence. So I thought about that and I said, well, if I were you, I would send a telegram to every grandmother in Poland <laughs> telling her to erase the halos that she has already written on the uh, five portraits of John Paul II she's got in her house. I mean, this is, this is going on all over the place here. Um, so. There we are, virtues and halos. Yes, ma'am, back here. Yeah, you mentioned the story with Irina and the Russian yeah. inside. Did John Paul II happen to you having those relationships with people from the United States? And um, what kind of questions, I guess, was he asking about American culture? Well, I, you know, um, he, we certainly talked about that with some frequency. Um, he was a keen reader of First Things. Jeevish used to read First Things cover to cover, and then every month Father Newhouse would get a kind of report card on the magazine from, <laughs> from uh, Jeevish. Um, uh, I think he, you know, he listened to the bishops of the United States, I mean, particularly the ones that he thought had uh, a real insight into things. Um, uh, and some of his appointments, I think, reflected that willingness to, you know, to think boldly. Uh, John O'Connor to New York after six months as Bishop of Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, Francis George to Chicago after nine months as Archbishop of, of Portland, Oregon, and a few years as Bishop of Yakima. Um, these were men he, he, you know, took their read on things uh, seriously. Um, I'm sure there are others, but those are the things that uh, come to mind immediately right now. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Well, in the context of trying to understand the Pope from the inside, as you said, could you comment on his relationship with the lesson that you know, he saw her? And like, yeah, that's a good question. It gives me a chance to rehearse my uh, talk to our parish sodality communion <laughs> breakfast this coming Sunday. Uh, if you look at his vocational memoir that he published in 1996 on the 50th anniversary of his priestly ordination, Gift and Mystery, it seems like a very light book until you start reading it closely. And then there's, there's a lot of stuff underneath the surface there. And one of the seemingly throwaway lines that I think is in, quite revelatory is him talking about uh, when he moved from Vadovica to Krakow with his father in the summer of 1938 to begin his undergraduate studies at the Agalonian University. Um, he, he, was, he said he was dissatisfied with the conventional Marian piety of, of, of the town. 
of where he had grown up. He thought it was a distraction from the Lord Jesus. Um, and, and he was just going to put that behind him. Then during the war, the same uh, quite remarkable figure, and this, this is a man who was surrounded by remarkable figures his whole life, again in this non-coincidental providential way. Uh, the eighth grade educated tailor, autodidact, uh, mystic, uh, an expert in Carmelite spirituality, Jan Taranowski, who introduced him to John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, also gives him Louis de Montfort's true devotion to Mary, true devotion to Our Lady. And uh, he writes in there, it's, the first, it's probably the only time he slashed a little bit of literary criticism. He says, Montfort wrote in a rather ornate Baroque style, which is certainly true, but it was that book that showed him that uh, all true Marian piety is Christocentric and therefore Trinitarian. That Mary's role in the economy of salvation is always to point toward her son, and because her son is both son of God and son of Mary, she points us into the Trinity. So true Marian piety breaks open the two central mysteries of Christian faith, the incarnation and the Trinity. Now, I think later in life, um, in the 70s and early 80s, he found a richer theological explication of all that in uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar. Uh, when Balthasar talks about uh, permanent images that shape the church over time. You know, the, the image of Peter in the church shapes the church of authority and jurisdiction. The image of, of St. John, the beloved in the church, always shapes and reshapes the church of contemplative prayer uh, as the image of St. Paul uh, shapes the church of evangelization and proclamation and so forth. And he then, in, in a speech to the Roman Curia in 1987, he, he, he ex explicated that, and then with Balthasar said, but prior to all of those is the image of Mary, because she is the first of disciples. Uh, and the, the, the double fiat, the fiat articulated at the Annunciation, and the silent fiat captured by Michelangelo and perhaps the greatest statue ever sculpted, the Pietà. Um, uh, that's the pattern of all discipleship. And all these other things, proclamation, evangelization, contemplation, authority, jurisdiction, are at the service of that um, fiat, that, that first act of discipleship with which models the Christian life for all of us. So the prior image in the church, a certain priority, he called it in his careful way, is the image of Our Lady. Uh, and that's more important, in, in a sense, than all of the others. And the others only make sense uh, because of that. Uh, this was an interesting thing to say to 300 curial officials who think they are the church, <laughs> In a, in a very concentrated form, you know, that none of this makes any sense, you know, without this woman of faith. Uh, it's a little bit like Bishop Ullathorne asking John Henry Newman, Father, what are the laity for? And Newman replying, well, your grace, we would look rather silly without them. <laughs> it's that, that sense that discipleship is at the foundation of, of everything else. Um, so I think that's how he thought about it. Um, and as, as for the luminous mysteries, which are perhaps the thing that people will remember about his Marian piety, uh, I think he, he, he was really a man of the Bible. And um, I think he found the New Testament was a bit missing uh, in the 15 uh, traditional mysteries. Certainly the public ministry of the Lord was missing. And, you know, I have to say when I... He pulled that one after Witness to Hope. 
And um, I'm already thinking about the second book. I, oh my God, what did he do that for? Uh, and then I was with a bunch of young people in the Catholic chaplaincy at Williams College in Massachusetts, which is pretty hardcore, secular stuff, very mission territory. And they, after my talk, they invited me to pray the Luminous Mysteries of the Rosary with them, which I did. I was totally blown away. I mean, they really do bring uh, a much more richly biblical and, and indeed Eucharistic, because of both Cana and, and the Last Supper, uh, the institution of the Eucharist, dimension to, to praying the rosary. So I think, you know, that was, that's, that's a part of his Marian piety that I think will continue uh, to live on uh, in the church. I look forward to uh, meeting many of you uh, outside. I'm happy to sign books for you. Uh, or to take any questions, but I think Professor Sneed wants to uh, call us to a reception. Move here. to the next phase of our conversation where we can sign, get books signed for you and continue our conversation. Th join me again in thanking our wonderful speaker.